Government officials are grappling with another problem for the nuclear energy industry. They're debating how to dispose of high-level waste produced by power plants. The government enacted a law in 2000 to bury the waste hundreds of meters underground, but the plan stalled when people living near candidate burial sites opposed it. Top scientists recommended scrapping the policy. A panel of government experts has reopened discussion on the matter. Some want to press on with the plan, but only after informing the public about the options and asking local governments to cooperate. Others say it's time to think of new options. Officials will also discuss whether Japan should continue reprocessing spent nuclear waste or dispose of it directly. Engineers decommissioning Fukushima Daiichi are getting ready to apply a new tool to a growing problem. They're testing a system to decontaminate wastewater that's accumulating at a rate of hundreds of tons a day. They hope to put it into full operation this autumn. Officials with Tokyo Electric Power Company gave the Nuclear Regulation Authority a report on the tests. They said the system is running well. The advanced liquid processing system can remove 62 types of radioactive material. It can treat 250 tons of water a day. TEPCO has three such systems. Engineers have been testing one since late March. Regulators gave TEPCO permission to start testing the other two systems in the middle of next month. About 400 tons of contaminated water accumulates every day. Government officials and TEPCO engineers hope to see all the decontamination systems running at full capacity as soon as possible. Japanese and American scientists are sailing off the coast of Fukushima in Japan and studying the sea. They're checking whether radioactive material from the nuclear disaster two years ago is still affecting the ocean. NHK World's Yoichiro Tateiwa reports from onboard the research vessel Umita Kamaru. The team of scientists sailed out of Tokyo on Monday. They will spend 10 days testing the waters of northeastern Japan. On Friday, they approached to about 5 kilometers of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. The team members are collecting water and marine species from various depths and taking soil from the seabed. They are aiming to find out whether the release of radioactive material is still affecting the environment and whether there have been any further leaks. Ken Butler leads the Americans on the team. He says they want to shed light on the medium and long-term effects of the accident using the technologies of both the U.S. and Japan. The scientists will be taking samples at a various locations until next Thursday in hopes of getting answers. Yoichiro Tateiwa, NHK World, off the coast of Fukushima. The client is bringing an increasing number of tourists to Japan from Southeast Asia. Japanese government officials have organized a meeting in Tokyo to try to attract even more of them from the region. The tourism agency invited officials from over 100 travel companies in six countries, including Thailand and Singapore. Tourism industry officials in Japan also took part in the meeting. The number of visitors from these six Southeast Asian nations to Japan totaled nearly 104,000 in March. That was up 50 percent from a year earlier. Officials of Toyama Prefecture in central Japan were trying to pitch popular tourist sites like high walls of snow along an alpine route. I found that people from Southeast Asia are strongly interested in snow scenery. We've got a good response. You are currently a tourist? Yes. Is it increasing to Japan? Yes, increasing, very increasing. It's so very significant during the, this year. Japanian decrease, right? Japanian. Ah. Yeah. So attract people to go to Japan. The event's organizers also held a seminar on ways to arrange tours for Muslim visitors. Travel agents learned how to prepare the food allowed under Islamic dietary guidelines. People in Vietnam are enduring a shortage of electricity. Government officials and business people in the United States see that shortage as an opportunity. So they're on a mission to sell American nuclear technology. Under Secretary of Commerce Francisco Sanchez and representatives of firms in the U.S. nuclear industry held a seminar in Hanoi. They told officials from electric utilities what the United States has to offer and got a sense of what the Vietnamese need. 
Commercial opportunities in the civil nuclear industry here are currently estimated at $10 billion, and they are expected to grow to $50 billion by 2030. Sanchez said the nuclear industry presents a great chance for Vietnamese and Americans to work together more closely. The Americans try to lay concerns about nuclear safety. They explained how representatives of the public and private sectors joined hands to make plants safer after the accident in Fukushima. Vietnamese leaders ordered their country's first and second nuclear power plants from Russia and Japan. U.S. officials have been negotiating with them in hopes of reaching an agreement to cooperate on civilian nuclear technology. Islamist suicide bombers have attacked two targets in the West African country of Niger. They killed at least 20 people. Militants broke through defenses at an army barracks in the northern city of Agadez. Then they detonated a car packed with explosives. Government officials say at least 19 people were killed. At the same time, another group drove into a mine in the town of Arlit, some 250 kilometers away. They too had loaded their vehicle with bombs. Managers of the French nuclear firm Areva run the facility. They said the militants killed one of their employees and wounded 14 others. An Islamist group based in neighboring Mali claimed responsibility for both attacks. Islamist militants took control of northern Mali last year. Troops from France and several African countries moved in to help the government stop their advance. The insurgents have retaliated with cross-border attacks, including a hostage raid in January at an Algerian gas plant. So the Hanford site is not a nuclear power plant, but they did used to run nine reactors for the purpose of producing plutonium for uh, atomic bombs. Uh, but this is all old news, so what's new? They have announced that there have been several tanks now that have been leaking after a period of years where they weren't. There's a long history of cover-up regarding these tanks. And in the late 1980s, uh, while working for Senator Glenn on the Government Affairs Committee, we were the first to force the department or compel them to reveal the magnitude of the leaks at the Hanford tanks, which turned out to be over 1 million gallons Roughly one-third of the tanks, more than one-third of the tanks at the site were, had leaked. They mitigated the problem somewhat by, by what they called uh, removing as much liquid as they can from the tanks, leaving behind salts. But these tanks are not holding up, and they're still now uh, resuming leakage. And they also built a second generation of tanks that have what are called double-shell tanks that have two steel liners. And one of those has already sprung a leak. So, Arnie, can you give us a little bit of history about what went on at Hanford? The Hanford site dates back to the Manhattan Project, and it was designed and, and built in the early 1940s to make plutonium for, for nuclear bombs. The site had as many as nine reactors, and the reactors created the plutonium in their fuel. But that's not how you make a bomb. You've got to chemically strip out that plutonium so the Hanford site had the reactors creating irradiated fuel, and then the fuel was chemically stripped of the plutonium to make the bombs. So the spent fuel was plutonium plus a bunch of other radioisotopes, which was then refined. About 1% so of the spent fuel in terms of radioactive content is plutonium, or actually by, by weight. So they took it to what are called chemical separations plants where they dissolved the spent fuel in nitric acid and then used solvents to extract out the uranium and the plutonium and then left behind this waste stream, which they then mostly poured into these 177 tanks, which these are the wastes that are considered to be high-level radioactive wastes. What is in that waste? Well, every element on the periodic chart is in those wastes. The wastes make up about 54 million gallons. They contain about 194 million curies of radioactivity, somewhere around one to one and a half metric tons of plutonium are sitting in the sludge of these tanks. So the plan A was when they stripped out the plutonium that they would just put this liquid gook into tanks. Then plan B was that they would then make better tanks, double-walled tanks. And now plan C is that they're building 
a facility out there that's years behind schedule to solidify the contents of these tanks. That's correct. 